Dr. Tola Dabiri, newly minted. I love to say it, and I'm going to keep saying it. Thank you so much for that wonderful elucidation of orality, of uh, the, the comparative analysis of uh, our what we, we call our Caribbean masquerade and making the links to the, uh, the sort of uh, mass, uh, the sort of celebrations that exist in the West African context, making those links. There is a lot of wonderful work uh, being done around these, these topics. There's been an upsurge of interest, I would say, of late around the Caribbean making these uh, now uh, just listening to um, what you were saying about the uh, the traditional nation dance and the way that the song goes I was just commenting now that we have had a lot of contact with uh, West African film with Nollywood uh, we see how our speech patterns we see these oralities how we say oh at the end of our, our our sentences right and we see how that is something that that we have in common there and that is something that we've retained and it's so it's so important to see ourselves uh, like uh, Stuart Hall says the présence africaine is very much something that imbues uh, the Caribbean landscape and to to have the world open up in the way that it has and to be able to make these connections was um, really, uh, really important. And I know, as I say, I've, I'm in these PhD trenches myself, so I know that this is the beginning of what is going to be a lifelong project. <laughs> and I want to encourage those of you who are on the Zoom and are interested in this type of work to uh, come on board and support Tola's work and to, um, you know, we have our own work that we're doing in Grenada. And I think that we, it can only be enhanced um, having this kind of scholarship added to the body of literature on mass and masquerade, not just in Grenada, but in the Caribbean as a whole. So Tola, I'm gonna, ask you to stay with us and uh, I'm going to read you some of the comments just to, to let you know I've been following the live stream on the government information service and we have uh, about 40 people on there listening wow. and commenting and um, saying thank you for bringing this information to us and, and some people offering like you said gentle gentle corrections around ancestor worship and and uh, one person pointing out that the way that our West, West African ancestors engaged in quote unquote worship is not the way we understand it in sort of the European context right that it was a, a, a really different sort of um, sort of scenario there so yes people are excited and and listening along and we're really really happy that your lecture was really well received somebody uh commented on the la on the zoom i am looking forward to the connections you will make between the iterations of ancestral masquerades throughout the region and then back to the continent and i think you're well placed to be that bridge between uh our part of the world and and the ancestral the ancestral lands right and and like you say living that diasporic experience yourself so thank you very much again and uh, we have uh, I would encourage those of you who are listening in to put your questions in the chat put your comments in the chat for Tola Tola I'm going to ask you a question in my role as moderator. You mentioned earlier that you had, and, and we call it sort of an insider outsider uh, moment, approaching the topic of mass itself and um, thinking through what, you know, sort of what do I have to offer in that? How did you, how did you bridge that? How did you kind of, overcome that and say, you know what, I believe that I have something to offer here on the subject of mass and um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for it. What was the thing that really sparked that? 
It, it was a compulsion. It was that that sort of like those early conversations that I had with Caribbean um, carnivalists in the UK who uh, could not see themselves in their masquerade, that their masquerade was something that was put on them. And um, I just really, even at that time, so this was 2011, really felt that, you know, we have to own our own history. And so I wanted to just have a look and see, well, are they right about this? It doesn't feel right to me that this is something that doesn't belong to people of African descent or people of African descent in the Caribbean. I'm pretty certain that, that what they're saying to me isn't the case. And so that's what I thought I had to bring to it. And also because I'd had the earlier um, experience of, of studying orality, I felt that I had a way in and a, a ready way, made way of actually understanding um, how to talk to the Caribbean carnivists that I came to that wasn't rooted in text. So um, those two things really, I really just wanted to see mm -hmm. was it nothing to do with these people. I'm going to follow up with you on the question of orality, just because as somebody who is interested in oral history myself, I know how important that tradition of orality is uh, for people of uh, from the, the, the African continent. And for, like you said, orality is really our first form, right, mm -hmm. of, uh, of communication. What does that focus on orality, you think, uh, what does it open up? uh to help us to understand outside like you said of the of the european frame what does it what what does it give to us as caribbean people understanding our own selves through that that methodology of orality the use of or, or rather accepting orality as a, as a valid form of um exploration allows ordinary people to actually discuss their own history or their histories as they understand it. One of the, the most heartbreaking things when you're researching as you probably found Tess was that you will ask somebody about something they'll say, I don't know anything about it. So I will talk to people and say, oh, can you tell me about how you learned about it? And they'll say, oh, well, you know, somebody told me and that's not viewed as a very good thing. Whereas actually the real information is, is being held by the community. So I think accepting orality, as I say, it's not accepting orality, only orality, but accepting orality is a valid place for starting your research. I think it actually allows ordinary people to actually then become much more active in the process of research and active in the process of discovering their own history. Because we're talking about, you know, this is, this is the whole thing. And this is why doing this lecture was very daunting to me because I'm, I'm talking to people in Grenada about the health intangible culture heritage of Grenada, well, it's yours, it's not mine. Mm -hmm. And so actually allowing people to own their own history and being able to express it in a way that's very natural to them through orality is very important. As I said, as I said, is a very valid place for starting your research because we're academics. So eventually, unfortunately, it does end up in literacy, but you know, to start your research in orality is a much more democratic thing. I, I, and I asked the question specifically for that reason, because we seem to privilege a certain kind of, of textuality. Uh, sometimes even in the Caribbean, we're, we're very guilty of that, of wanting to get it from a book uh, mm -hmm. in a way that we, we sort of devalue the, uh, the, the oral tradition as being, like you said, a valid place to start and to, and to move on from. And one of the comments that's being made right now uh, on the GIS Live is that students need to get involved in this kind of research and this kind of exploration. And that's something that needs to start very early. And one of the early easy ways that we can do that, that is through that process of orality is passing this down. And these, this, and, and I, I know some people on, on listening on here will be able to, um, to speak to that, that that used to be very present, something very present in our in our culture. So this is uh, these oral traditions, they do continue and they are retained and, and they are uh, places, like you said, to start to think about about this. So I'm going to take a, a question now from our our audience. And uh, somebody asked, 
uh, who should benefit uh, from the celebration of our ancestors' horror? I guess thinking through carnival uh, as a, a sort of uh, outcome of that horrific Middle Passage experience, who should benefit from the celebration? And, and a follow-up question to that is how authentic is our carnival and at what cost should we preserve our heritage? Oh my goodness, okay. Question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right, so taking the, the first one, who should benefit? Well, we should all benefit, but particularly those descendants of the people who survived the traumas of enslavement, be it the Middle Passage or the plantation system or surviving in the colonial era, um, which is sort of like just was an extension of enslavement, but that's in a whole other discussion. So I'll leave that there. But but I mean, carnival masquerade is an expression. It's a cultural expression. So I think it should benefit those people of whom whose culture it is. Does that make does that make sense? Does that answer the question? So I, I find it a bit of an odd question because when you talk about benefits, it's almost like if it belongs to one person, it can't belong to someone else. If somebody enjoys it, somebody else can't enjoy it. But I think, as I said earlier, sort of like, you know, the wonderful thing about Carnival Masquerade is it belongs to the people. That's where it belongs. It belongs to the people. So the people should benefit. So I've rambled on. What was the second question? Let me unmute myself. The second question had to do with the authenticity of our carnival. How authentic is our carnival? And at what cost should we preserve our heritage? Authenticity is a really tough one because the thing about intangible cultural heritage is you have to let it change. So one of my fears and one of the reasons that I believe that orality is probably the best way to um, preserve intangible cultural heritage is because it allows that flexibility. Textuality freezes things. And so if you write a book and say, this is shortly, and then somebody comes along and they does, do something slightly different, then the, sh the shortly that's slightly different becomes unauthentic or inauthentic. And so therefore, shortly then would become crystallized as one thing and it would never grow and change as it needs to, as it needs to adapt. And so if there is a weather displacement activity and it shortly couldn't take place on Grenada, it could take place somewhere else or the shortly that takes place in the UK takes place at different times, at different carnivals, but it's still shortly it's a bit like I was saying, like the stone in the river. It's still the same thing, but it will change its appearance because of the, the forces around it. And so I think that talking about authenticity is a really quite a dangerous thing. But I think that your carnival is authentic because it's your carnival. That, that's what I would say. Your carnival is authentic, so it's your carnival. Now, I know looking at that, there is the sort of like the tension between pretty mass and traditional mass. And um, in the UK, there's very little traditional mass now because pretty mass has taken over. But to an extent, pretty mass has become the traditional mass of the UK. It's the, the, the unified Caribbean carnival expression. So it doesn't matter which island you're from. If you're taking part in Leeds West Indian carnival, you'll probably be in a pretty mass costume because that's carnival, that has become carnival. So I think at, at what cost should you preserve your carnival, or your masquerade or your heritage? I think at all costs, that's my last question because as I said, it's sort of like it's an unbroken procession between ancestors past, but also ancestors future. So, you know, there are these people who are coming after us who have a, a, a as much of a stake in the in our history as we have now, as our ancestors did before us. So I think preserving it's really, really very important. Thank you, Tola. We've had uh, heated discussions about the authenticity of Grenadian jab jab, <laughs> given the the more recent iterations of uh, of of 
paint and pink paint and blue paint and blue devils and green devils. So there's there, there are these ongoing conversations mm. around um, how far we sort of let the culture evolve. There's mm. another question here uh, from Elaine Henry McQueen. And she said, the present, she's asking, the presenter mentioned possible origins of Jab Jab, such as the Buffalo Horn. Uh, can you expand a little bit on this? or please explain the origins further. And uh, what what have you found in your research that seems to be the most dominant expression when it comes to Jab Jab? Oh, well, to start with, to explain, um, as I said, I wanted to look at something that could not be called European. And so if you look at a Jab Jab, there's no way you can say, oh, there's an, that's an imitation of some European masquerade or European carnival costume. You can't say it. So that's why I looked at Jab Jab. And also because of Juve and the role of Juve and how that is so completely alien to um, British Caribbean carnival over here, because that's all about shows and pretty mass and everything. And looking at the Jab Jab at Juve, they were definitely doing their own thing. So it meant something very special to them. Um, so I started looking, as I said, about, about Horned and Devil Mass around the Caribbean and historical um, records of Horned and Devil Mass that's been, um, been uh, performed throughout the centuries. I don't have a definitive answer. Um, I don't know if I'll ever have a definitive answer. I feel like saying I don't have a definitive answer yet. But I think I have some clues, which is why I, I put those those things. And I think it really just depends on sort of like doing a process of elimination. So, as I say, the ECP um, in southeastern Nigeria do use black body coverings. But were people, were ECP people enslaved on, on Jamaica? I'm um, sorry, still didn't say Jamaica. I don't know what's going on in my head. Were, um, Equity people enslaved on Grenada. And if they're enslaved on Grenada, were they in St. David's? There's sort of like this whole further important looking at sort of like possible links and clues to do, which unfortunately in my PhD research, people think that when you're doing a PhD that, you know, you've got all the time in the world to look at everything, but you really haven't. So um, that's another area of, of really deep research that I think needs to be done. And I think it needs to be done in an international way. So this is one of those international partnerships that I was talking about. So um, the reason I mentioned the Buffalo Horn was because um, I have a, a, a real bee in my bonnet about the jab jab being devil devil because the Christian devil is always represented as a goat. And so the horns come out of the front of the head in Jab Jab, the horns come out of the side of the head, like a buffalo, like a, a like a bull, like a cow. And so therefore, that's another reason why I don't, personally, I don't believe that it is just a representation of the Christian devil, because the horns are not representative of a symbol of a European Christian devil. And so then I was looking at um, examples of um, spirituality, um, across West Africa that use or that had a representation of those forms of horns. And I did briefly see someone when I said that Us Isu, um, the trickster who's often known as a devil, I'm not saying that Isu is the devil, but there are some traditions in South America, as well as some people in Yoruba culture who do refer to him as a devil, mainly because that's an easier way of trying to explain what that character is, but not that the Usu is the devil. So I do understand and I do apologise if I gave any offence by saying that, because I know that there are still many followers of Usu around the um, African diaspora. Right. So, um, mm -hmm. so those are my reasons for looking at um, Oya, the, and also because of her role and her relationship to Shango and Shango being such a powerful deity still across the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. But there's so much, so much research that's still needed. Mm -hmm. Somebody, uh, I'm just going to read out a comment uh, from Keila Francis here. She says, I think your musings, your musings on syncretism are quite apropos. JD, El Elder, Raphael, Inku and Juku, et cetera, all look at the syncretic nature of our masquerade. So there's a lot, again, that you can find in the work that's being done around the Caribbean. Valerie Joseph says, I agree. 
about your uh, point about authenticity. Our experience is authentic to us as people of the African diaspora. It is a trap to think it's authentic only if it's exactly like something from the motherland. We are shaped by history and authentic experience in itself. And we have, uh, I think one final question uh, from Relisha Andrews and she asked, truly the presentation of carnival is an art form. Do you think that carnival has an aesthetic? And if yes, how does it affect its preservation? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, no, carnival is an art form, but um, that's quite a, it's a tricky one for me to answer <laughs> from the UK because um, in the UK, carnival is presented exclusively as an art form. So we talk about carnival arts and we talk about performance and we talk about carnival, it's described as a combined art. And so all of the um, intangible cultural heritage that I talk about isn't really recognized as important. It is recognized it's there, but it isn't recognized as important. And interestingly enough, um, the pandemic and the digital presentations of carnival, which took place over here, actually allowed carnivalists to take control of the narrative away from the Arts Council and Heritage Lottery and all the other um, government agencies here and actually start talking about the heritage and the intangible cultural heritage in carnival in a much more open and confident way than I've ever heard. So yes, I do agree that carnival is an art form there is music, there's dancing, there's performance, there's costume, there's design, I understand all of that. But I steer clear of looking at that or talking about that because it's very easy to have the, the intangible cultural heritage subsumed by the arts part from my perspective here in the UK. So, yes. Did I answer that question? You're looking very quizzical. <laughs> No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm functioning in many uh, roles, Tola. So I have to keep an eye on the, uh, on the chat, and I have to keep an eye on. I have to listen for when you're done. So that was, that was not with the answer to your question at all. I'm just keeping an eye on the time and and so on. Um, uh, Dr. Nancy Jacobs is asking, and I think we're going to take that one as our final question. Have you ever considered looking at the origins of masquerade? And I think Tola, this is a, this is an excellent recommendations for further research. Looking at the origins of masquerade linked to ethnic groups that were resident in Grenada. So yes, I have. Yes, I have. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. Yes, I have. Because the thing that really fired me up after my research trip, I have to tell you, when I came to Grenada to do my research, my field research, my, my enthusiasm for my PhD was waning, really was, because you get to the middle and it's just like, I can't stand this anymore. But it was, I was completely enthused by everything that I found. And so thank you. The thing that really fascinated me more than anything and I'm coming from a, 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 a culture where there's a very homogenized view of Caribbean carnival or seaside carnival or whatever. So carnival is pretty much the same wherever you go and see it in the UK. Um, that within a tiny island, there were so many different forms of masquerade that were geographically linked to their performers. So I went to Verkel to see, um, oh, sorry, I went to St. Mark's to see Verkel. I didn't go to St. Patrick's or St. Patrick's, no, I had to go to St. Mark's. And I found that really, really fascinating. One of the things I want to know is why. Why, the, why have these masquerades developed in such tight locality? Was it because, as I was saying about Jab Jab, were there many people, were there many key people who were um, captive there? And that's why that particular form of body covering was, was popular there. What happened? Well, you know, were there lots of Yoruba people practicing Igungun in St. Patrick's and that developed into Shortney? So, yes, thank you, Nancy. Yes, it's definitely, I want to know why about that. And I'm very excited to come back and have another look. Awesome, awesome. I, I spend this term teaching a research methods class. And one of the things I keep saying to my students is that academics have a nifty little mechanism 
called recommendations for further research you know <laughs> that that's what keeps us going <laughs> forever and ever thank you again uh, so much dr tola dabiri for what uh, mr uh, jared antoine has described as a really uh illuminating and wonderful presentation he says congratulations to all at this time uh, the the last question that you took uh, is from none other than our 2023 uh, lecturer in the person of Dr. Nancy Ferguson Jacobs. And she will be giving the annual commemorative emancipation public lecture. And we can announce that that will be on Monday, July 31st, 2023 under the theme Understanding Slavery, Emancipation, and Reparations, addressing themes like Africa before the transatlantic trade in enslaved Africans, African development at the time of European industrialization. And uh, Dr. Editha Nancy Ferguson Jacobs has celebrated 49 years and we will be the beneficiaries of 49 years as a graduate teacher and specialist lecturer in Caribbean history, culture, and African art, art history. She has done much research on the intangible heritage and origins of Barbados landship. She is the author of the book, Full Steam Ahead, Locating the Barbados Landship, which ensures that the people of Barbados have a better understanding of their African origins in Ghana and the role of the ASOFO institution. If you like what you're hearing, if that is exciting for you, Dr. Jacobs is with us this evening. We're very happy to have her. Be back here, same time, same place for the annual commemorative emancipation public lecture. I have been your moderator for this evening, Tesla Peterson. At this time, it is my pleasure to welcome Ms. K. Julian Gutu, who is a currently employed with the National Training Agency and a member of the Institute for People and People's Enlightenment. She is the Marketing and Communications Officer at the National Training Agency. Her career in communications spans 27 years. I remember seeing her on TV as a presenter when I was a, a younger person, so I know that very well at the Grenadian Broadcasting Network, and she rose to Senior News Editor and Acting News Director. Kay, it is my pleasure to welcome you to deliver the vote of thanks for us this evening. Welcome. Thank you very much, Tesfer, for that introduction. Good evening, everyone. It is my pleasant duty on behalf of the Institute for People's Enlightenment to say thank you to all of you who have contributed to making this evening's annual commemorative emancipation lecture a success. First, I express thanks to His Excellency Ambassador Ali Gill, Chairman of the Grenada National Reparations Commission for his emancipation message at the beginning of today's proceedings. Centuries later, we are still striving and resilient. Also thanks to Dr. Nicole Philip Dahl, head of the University of the West Indies, Open Campus Grenada, for her welcome message. The IPA has created a very strong partnership with the UWI Open Campus Grenada, and we thank them for their support. To my fellow IPE director designate, Akira Lessi, thank you for that beautiful reading of the Emancipation Citation lest we forget the full significance of August 1st, 1838. Thank you, Tesfer, Aki Peterson, for ably moderating this evening's event to mark the observance of Emancipation Day. It could not have been done without you. What better way to start the evening than with a moment of silence in tribute to our ancestors and for our deceased founding members. Also, for the advance notice for next year's lecture. We look forward to all of you participating again. To our special guest speaker, Tola DeBerry, PhD, for what has been a jaw-dropping experience as she took us back and into the roots of some of our African-Grenadian culture. We are truly thankful, Tola, 
that we have been able to participate and to understand more deeply the importance of orality in keeping our culture alive. Thank you so much for your research and all the hard work you have done. Finally, thank you to all who have joined this forum from around the globe, from the Caribbean and the diaspora, via Zoom, Facebook, and other social media, and for having participated to the question and answer. Without you, there would be no lecture. Thanks to all the organizers, IP, CEO, and directors who have worked hard and tirelessly to ensure this event came off, and to the media for its usual support, including GIS for its live streaming on Facebook this evening. Until next year, thank you all. <laughs>